Hi, my name's Steve Evans. I'm a consultant for Friends of the River, which is California's statewide river conservation group. And I'm Lucas Rosmers. I'm the executive director of the Sacramento River Preservation Trust, born and raised in Chico, California. Friends of the River and the Sacramento River Preservation Trust are here today because we want to introduce people to the Sacramento River and talk about uh, the potential impacts on the river from the proposed site's off-stream storage reservoir, which is a reservoir that the California Department of Water Resources and many other water agencies are promoting to solve, uh, uh, supposedly solve, California's water crisis. Uh, but we're very concerned that diversions uh, from the Sacramento River here behind us will harm the river. And so that's why we're here to uh, give people a sort of tutorial on the river and, and the potential impacts that this project would have. The River Preservation Trust's real interest in exploring what sites might do. It's part of the North of Delta Offstream Storage Project portfolio, which has been uh, developed and researched for decades and decades. A lot of public tax dollars have been spent investigating the potential benefits and impacts of this project for decades. And we're here today to talk about the fact that we need some other solutions. We need a real environmental impact report process to take place so the public and the agencies and our own organizations can have a look at a real project, not just the beautiful maps and models that have been created without truly defining a project and giving the public uh, a time to investigate and give our opinions on such a project. So we're excited to share the beauty and the majesty of the Sacramento River and the Antelope Valley, which is a gorgeous valley in the northern state. And uh, we're excited for the beautiful day. You've got... Oh, thank you. Friends of the River has always punched above its weight. And when uh, Dr. Wilkerson said that, I, uh, it resonated with me because here we were in a small room with the entire staff. And, and this is a, uh, uh, an organization for 40 years that's been doing good work in California for rivers, always on a tight budget and always undermanned. And yet they win. No. All right, I'd, with that, sometimes. I'd like to, what's that? Win sometimes. Yes, yes. All right. Was it, was it uh, David Brower who said, our, our wins are only temporary, <laughs> and we need to keep, <laughs> keep semper, uh, semper vigilant? Um, in any case, what I'd like to do is to just orient you a little bit to the day. This, this event is sponsored jointly by Friends of the River uh, and the Sacramento River Preservation Trust. And coincidentally, our key speakers today are from both those organizations. Uh, Friends of the River is a statewide organization uh, devoted to protecting California rivers, as far south as San Diego and as far north as the Smith. Um, and uh, 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 the Sacramento River Preservation Trust is focused not only on the Sacramento River but on the surrounding valley lands and farmlands. So they're, they're, they're devoted to protecting the river and the wildlife and the habitat along the river and doing what they can to enhance it and protect it, but doing it in the context of working comfortably and honestly and directly with the uh, farming community throughout the, the uh, Sacramento River Valley. Um, both Steve and Lucas have extensive backgrounds in their field. Steve's uh, role with, with, and I'll let him embellish on it later or add to it, but I just wanted to say that his, his, his primary, he was a full-time employee with Friends of the River, uh, what, from 1984 until 1990 something? Or? 1988 to oh, okay. 2011. 2011. And he still is uh, the uh, point of the spear when it comes to uh, wild and scenic river uh, designation and advocacy uh, for the organization. Uh, he has an extensive background uh, in river work, uh, which began many years ago up here in, uh, actually in Chico, was it Chico and mm -hmm. so Butte County. I'm actually a, a co-founder of the Sacramento River Preservation Trust. Oh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Uh, welcome home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, Lucas, uh, uh, let's see, how should I say this? 
He was founded by the co-founders of the <laughs> <laughs> Sacramento River Preservation Trust, uh, and uh, so he's he's. Uh, almost as old as the trust itself and the trust is 32 years old <laughs> 31 and a half uh, but uh, uh, Lucas has been doing a superb job uh, as an executive director for the trust I first recognized him two years ago uh, in May when he was a, a speaker on behalf of the trust who was a beneficiary can you can you hand me the orange hat down there out of the bag yeah I, I need to change hats for a minute <laughs> okay thank you thank you all right so this is this is my California 100 hat uh, <laughs> It's not bragging if you've done it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the beneficiary of the funds from that event is, uh, is the Sacramento River Preservation Trust. And so Lucas was a keynote speaker at our awards ceremony, and he did a great job. In fact, I was really impressed. I had never heard anyone speak so articulately on river issues, wildlife issues, and local economy issues all in, in an all-encompassing way. I was very impressed. And when we were looking for uh, a speaker and a uh, beneficiary for another event called Paddle California, which is a four-day, three-night, fully supported canoeing, kayaking, camping trip from Redding all the way down to Scotty's Landing just outside of Chico. Uh, well, the first person we called was Lucas. And uh, those, those are the sponsors, these are the speakers uh, who will be leading you today and discussing the issues such as we know them. And that's, that's a big issue, is the, the degree of uncertainty. We know where, we just don't know how. And, uh, and, and we're waiting to hear. Because until you have a, a few more specifics, it's really hard to have a conversation with someone. Uh, it, it, it's almost like a presidential primary, if I could go so far as to say that. And, you know, you don't get into the specifics until after the election, and then it's too late. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about what we think we know and what we will be watching uh, for and what we're concerned about. Uh, and uh, we hope to do that in an even-handed way and, and just be another reference point and a source of information for you. Um, and we hope that we inspire you as well. We hope that we inspire you both on behalf of the Sacramento River Trust and, and Friends of the River. Um, I don't know if all of you are members of one or the other, but I'd certainly encourage it. Uh, I've, been, I, I've really been in love with rivers most of my adult life. Uh, and uh, uh, it pleasures me greatly to be a member of both of these organizations and, by the way, the, Sacram or the San Joaquin River Parkway down in Fresno, where I grew up. Uh, so, I mean, I know that they do good work, and I'm, I'm very thankful to be a part of it. Okay, uh, I'd like to turn it over. Which one of you would like to speak first? Well, actually, morning? I think uh, we should do a round of introductions. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a consultant for Friends of the River. I live in Sacramento, worked for Friends of the River since 1988. But before that, um, I lived in Chico and was uh, general manager of the Butte Environmental Council, and along with Lucas's dad, was one of the co-founders of the Sacramento River Preservation Trust. So I have a lot of background and love for this great river flowing by us today. Okay. And I'm Grace Marvin. I've lived in Chico since 84. I'm from the East Coast originally. And I got invited here, fortunately, because I'm active with the Mother Load chapter. I'm the conservation chair of the local Sierra Club. And um, I'm also on their water committee. So I was really delighted to find out that I could come here because I'm very concerned about water transfer sites, tunnels, ad infinitum. <laughs> Are you on the State Water Committee? Yes, CNRCC. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm Lucas Rosmers. I'm the Executive Director of the Sacramento River Preservation Trust. I was born in Chico, went away to college at San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly, 
and uh, studied environmental management, focused in water policy and hydrology, then ran away to the rivers, got to guide with some of the people in the circle today, and uh, have been in love with rivers my whole life. I'm very excited to share with all of you some of the amazing public lands and some of our beautiful valleys on the west side. Antelope Valley today should be gorgeous with the recent rains. The wildflowers should be blooming. Um, and we'll talk about some of the proposed solutions to our water problems here in California. I'm Ben Milkey. <clears throat> um, I grew up in the Bay Area, but when I was a kid, my grandfather had a house on the banks of the Sacramento in the town of Tehama, and sort of the river's always been around most of my life one way or another. Um, I work in organic farms, and I just I came here to learn about this. I've heard about it for a long time. Uh, I'm Richard Weiss. I'm a volunteer and board member for Friends of the River, um, and I helped uh, train uh, Lucas as a river guide. Uh, so uh, the site reservoir is one of the topics that comes up frequently um, in board meetings and uh, I wanted to learn more about it which is why I'm here today. I'm Colby Tucker. Uh, I currently work for the US EPA. Um, I've had roles with Cal Trout in previous years. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast and I'm now living in San Francisco um, and I'm interested in water resources uh, across the United States and in California. I'm Heinrich Albert. Um, I live in Alameda. I am the co-chair of the Sierra Club's Bay Area Water Committee. And along with Tom, I went through the uh, Friends of the River River Rat training earlier this year. I'm Hal Thomas. I'm a special deputy district attorney in Butte County. I'm representing Mike Ramsey, the elected today. Um, I've uh, spent years in the North Valley and uh, walked through sites 30 years ago and uh, uh, remember there was talk of a reservoir and so now I'm going to find out what that talks about. Hi, I'm Kathy Lieb. I'm from Sacramento and active with 350.org Sacramento, which is working on climate change issues. And I don't need to say anything more, I think, <laughs> other than... Uh, river policy, water policy, and sustainable cities that emit less carbon is all connected, so I'm here. <laughs> yeah, my name's Tom Marr, I live in Sacramento. I'm an engineer, been involved in water projects for a long time, uh, so I'm here to find out more about sites. Tom Piglione, looks like Big Lion with an E on the end, and um, I spent the first 10 years of my career as a civil engineer for the city of Oakland and for Bechtel Power Corporation. Um, then changed careers and went into financial planning and have had my own life insurance agency now for 16 years. Um, but uh, the engineering always comes back and I enjoy it, particularly uh, because my favorite professor was actually Dr. Albert Einstein's son, Albert Einstein Jr., who taught <laughs> hydraulics at Cal. And uh, uh, every time I go through a, 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 a hydraulic jump on a river, uh, standing waves, I, I think of him. <laughs> All right. You missed two people. I'm Kirsten, and I'm from Morgan Hill, and I'm on spring break, so my papa decided to take me with him on this day trip. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I'm Gene Bealey from Central Valley Business Times and stocked in a digital news service. Uh, the Sacramento River National Wildlife Refuge is a very special, uh, basically, set of units that are all along the main stem of the Sacramento River. Basically from Red Bluff all the way down to Calusa. And it's part of our recovery plan not only for riparian habitat, but for endangered and threatened species and anadromous fish species, um, which some of which are threatened or endangered. Um, so we're going to go to the Sol Norte unit. It's basically right there. So if you look at the other side of the river, that is the Sol Norte beach. Um, on both sides of it, you'll see some riparian restoration activity. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about some of the potential impacts of diversion for Tehama Calusa Canal Authority, which is just above the now defunct uh, Red Bluff Diversion Dam, and then the Glen Calusa Irrigation District, which is one of the senior water rights holders in the Sacramento River, just north of Hamilton City. Um, and they actually have the right to take about a third of the river year round. So they have big water rights, um, they can do a lot with those water rights, and they are one of the big elements within the site's JPA. Um, and uh, 
So we'll talk about that. And then the Delavan pipeline is gonna be something we talk about as well, which is a proposed intake facility on the non-reviewed supposed project known as sites. Um, and we'll talk about that process as well, what the California Environmental Quality Act is, what the National Environmental Policy Act is, um, how that process works and why it's so crucial that we review projects at that level and give um, our fish and wildlife agencies at the federal and state level an opportunity to, com uh, to comment, including the EPA and other groups um, to review those projects. And then also for the public and for non-governmental organizations like Friends of the River, and the trust to be able to review an actual project. Right now, it's, uh, there's a lot of analogies with sites, um, which we'll talk about, but it's basically a beautiful truck that you can't look at the engine until you buy it, right? So it's kind of, a lot of people use that car analogy because we've seen so much beautiful stuff about it, um, but we just haven't been able to see how it's actually going to work. You know, one of the big things that environmental conservation organizations get criticized about a lot, a lot of times is that we just say it's a bad project. And nowadays we know that we can't just say that your project is bad. We have to say we believe that that's a, a misuse of funds and we have better solutions. This is Bob Magic's new book. Um, called Sacramento, A Transcendent River. Bob Magic is very involved with the Sac River Trust. Um, and Steve and my dad are um, noted in the, in the first pages of the Preserve Restore um, and Advocate section of the book. Basically, the Sac River Trust was the first group to come to the defense of the Sacramento River back in 84 uh, with a group of dedicated folks. Uh, I believe there was five um, originally concerned folks from farming to, you know, mothers to advocates, um, Natalie Schaefer included. Um, and so it's, it's been an amazing ride and this book was just kind of fun because when it came out two years ago, it, it reestablished the fact that the trust is a major reason for all the great things that have happened. Um, just like Friends of the River, you know, it start with the Stan and Mark Dubois and their history as an organization. Um, trying to preserve free flowing rivers and talk about the economic benefit and the long term benefit. So we have all that good stuff. There's some other handouts here too for California Rivers Day, which is coming up, which is a day where uh, river organizations come and uh, basically meet with legislators in Sacramento. And we do a big uh, fun lawn display. Uh, we're probably gonna bring some drift boats down, some kayaks and some canoes this year, and just show that the paddle community and the fishing community are a huge part of the economy and the culture of California. So when we're planning for farms and fish and families, um, we can't forget that farms and families also use rivers for the fish and for the recreation and for the benefits. Um, so that's on here. There's also canoe classes, um, which are happening um, down in the Sacramento area. It's really fun to teach people how to get in a boat and feel safe. Um, people sometimes are afraid of rivers and I always crack up because I'm more afraid of the semi on I-5 and I don't know if its tires are gonna pop at any second. Uh, you know, when I'm on the river, I'm in control of my own destiny. So uh, the rundown for the day is after we leave here, which is probably when I'm done. Um, we'll get into cars and we're going to head right across the bridge. And basically the first turn on the right is where we're going to take out or, you know, pull off. As soon as we go over the bridge, just follow us in the caravan. Uh, there's a parking lot there. There's a bathroom there. Um, if you want to use the bathroom here, uh, it is just the beginning of fishing season. And as you see these cottonwood seeds floating in the air, that means the shatter running. So that's why you have so many boaters here right now. Not only are the stripers now basically in the river year round, but we also have the shad running. So as soon as these, these cotton balls start flying in the air, uh, the fishermen get hungry to go fight some shad on the end of a line. Um, Before you go, can you uh, repeat what you told us about the Calusa Irrigation District and what they're... Well, yeah, I was going to add that in. Oh, okay. Cool. Good. So just to put stuff in context, um, uh, this is the Sacramento River. It has uh, the largest reservoir in California on it upstream, Shasta Dam and Reservoir, which is a major component of our water system. Um, and uh, there's a number of reservoirs on tributaries uh, like Oroville Dam on the Feather and, and uh, uh, Black Butte Dam on Stony Creek. Um, but there's still opportunities, according to the water engineers, to build more surface storage. And so there's a lot of consideration of that going on. Site seems to be the one that's rising to the top, but another one uh, that is competing with it, or maybe not competing with it, but uh, that's being promoted at the same time is a 18 foot raise of Shasta Dam upstream of here that would add 
634,000 acre feet of storage to what is already the largest reservoir in California, about four and a half million acre feet. Um, that one has some policy issues. For one thing, raising the dam would violate state law protecting the McLeod River, and we're hoping that will uh, keep that project from moving forward. But uh, which is probably one of the reasons why the Sites Reservoir is the one that uh, you're hearing a lot more about. Uh, the other fact is is that because we already have the largest reservoir on the river behind Shasta Dam, it's often not that reservoir is often not very full. So adding more storage to that doesn't really give us much bang for the buck. I think the Bureau of Reclamation's estimate of the average annual yield of raising that dam at the cost of well over a billion dollars is a paltry 34,000 acre feet average annual uh, yield uh, a year. So uh, whereas sites uh, has, uh, according to DWR, they claim that sites will have an average annual yield about 488,000 uh, acre feet a year. Um, just to put all that in context, California's annual water budget is about 41 million acre feet. That includes both surface storage and groundwater. Uh, and so none of these projects would produce, uh, while well, sites being the largest, uh, it would add about 1% to the water budget. You know, and the question is, would it actually be providing that water during drought? And that's one of the big questions because uh, lacking a feasibility report, uh, we don't know for sure how much water it will produce and how it will be operated. One of the key questions that we'll talk about extensively today is uh, sites is an off-stream storage reservoir. It's a reservoir to be located in the western foothills of the coast range west of here. Eastern foothills of the coast range west of here, rather. <laughs> and it would be filled up with water diverted from the river. And they would use two existing diversions, one at Red Bluff and one above Hamilton City, the Glen Calusa Irrigation District diversion. And they're proposing a third one downstream of here called Delavan. And uh, if sites were in place today and uh, those upstream diversions were available to divert all the water they can divert to sites, this is a, I looked it up yesterday, this is about 9,000 uh, cubic feet per second flow right now. Those two diversions would cut that almost in half. Um, and uh, the proponents of sites uh, characterize the site's diversions as, oh, we're just skimming the high flows off the top, the high flood flows. And that's true from a big picture, but at times, site's diversions will be taking more than half the flow of the river. And, uh, taking more than half the what? The flow of the river. And that's our big concern because this is one of the healthiest rivers in California because even with the largest reservoir in, in the state, uh, because of all its undammed tributaries and just because its watershed is so huge, uh, it still uh, has a lot of natural flow. And that natural flow makes this river meander back and forth across the floodplain. So there's erosion of banks, which creates nesting habitat for bank swallows. And then there's uh, different stages of growth of riparian habitat. And you can see that right across the river here, if you look over there. In the background is old growth cottonwood trees. They've probably been there for about 50, 60, 80 years. Uh, just below that, just in front, is uh, willow uh, growth that's growing, uh, that's maybe about 10 years old. And that's a very important habitat. The, th this dynamic river moving back and forth, flooding its floodplains, eroding banks, uh, is one of the reasons why uh, there, uh, this river supports so many numerous uh, wildlife and fish species. Um, the habitat we're looking at right there is essential habitat for the endangered yellow-billed cuckoo, which is a, a songbird that migrates up here during the summer. They nest in the big cottonwood trees. They use the smaller uh, willows for foraging for food. And uh, at one point, the Corps of Engineers had a proposal that would have uh, put rock banks on every eroded uh, bank on this river to keep it from moving and from eroding. And that was one of the SAC Trust's first big uh, successes. We stopped that project and it's uh, hopefully will never return. The other big success was convincing the Fish and Wildlife Service 
to start acquiring habitat along the river to create the Sacramento River National Wildlife Refuge. And so we're very concerned that diversions uh, from the river to fill sites will affect the ecosystems and the uh, ecosystem uh, health of the refuge and the riparian habitat. Will yes. you also be addressing where the site's water would be used if it were to be built? As best as we can. Okay. And, and I, we'll keep emphasizing this. There is no feasibility report on this project. So whenever you hear people say sites will provide water for farms, it will provide water for cities, it will provide water for the environment, in a broad sense that's true, but how much and specifically to whom, we don't know without a feasibility report. And department, we've met twice in the last year with Department of Water Resources because we keep asking them where this is. They haven't produced a feasibility report because they as yet have no local partner that has agreed to sign on the dotted line saying we'll pay X amount of money for Y amount of water. Until someone does that, they don't know how the project will be operated. So when you hear that sites provides this long list of many benefits, it's highly speculative in terms of uh, the level of those benefits, particularly the environmental benefits. Let's walk down to the water, shall we? Oh, I'd like, okay. I'd like, to, I'd like to show you guys uh, this little trail. We're just gonna walk by the freeway down to the water's edge. You'll get to see all the great stuff. Steve just did a great entry uh, to what you're gonna see as you walk it. But this is all part of the discussion, is that we spent millions and millions and millions of dollars with these goals in mind. With these multi-benefit mm. goals in mind. Wow. Not just water storage, but smart water development, smart public land acquisition for species, farms, and fish, uh, and families, right? The whole, the whole deal. And Northern Calusa, that's what this is meant for, right? Shasta Dam was built for giving water to the Southern Central Valley during the Great Depression and during the reclamation era of that. Uh, but it was also built to protect Sacramento from flooding, right? When the state capital floods over and over again, eventually, uh, the legislature comes together and comes up with a solution. So it serves two purposes, flood control and to deliver water. Um, and so now though, north of Calusa, this is meant to flood. It's meant to be natural. It's meant to do these different things and support very important species and a way of life. Um, how, so, Question, how much private land is inside those boxes? A lot. Quite a bit. Okay. So pretty much everything you see that's not light green, except for oh. some other properties, um, are privately owned. The, the crazy thing about a river, right, is when it floods, it drops sediment. And so the best soil is normally the closest to the river channel in a lot of times. So that's the most valuable agricultural land. Uh, but flooded lands, you have to rake. You have to take away the, the, the woody debris and all the stuff that comes into your orchards. So all this land was purchased from willing sellers. People that it was not economical for them to continually have to manage after flood on those properties. And when they sold to... Uh, different entities, the Nature Conservancy or River Partners, um, to basically buy and then restore it and then hand it over to the federal government. Um, you know, a lot of times the federal government isn't necessarily the one that plants the trees. They're the ones that take the land and manage it in perpetuity for operation and maintenance for the good of the public from that point forward. Um, and so willing sellers, willing buyers is a big part of the story. Um, nowadays with you know, acreage being thirty to sixty thousand dollars an acre for walnut and ham ground in Northern California, uh, they're not selling as much. Um, but yeah, you can see here, and if you'd like any copies of the maps, um, you know, this has the entire refuge. Uh, these blue maps um, looks like there's enough for everyone here. Um, but yeah, we'll go for a walk, and we can all have one of these. So you'd find uh, you'd be able to see that. Some of the walnut trees were doing great and some not so great, and that's because of water intrusion in the groundwater. Walnut trees don't do great when the groundwater is up near the surface. And also, depending on high water years, if this area was flooded for a long time, it'd be hard to access it at times when the uh, farmer needed to uh, you know, maintain the orchard. So um, there was incentive to sell this land. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric you hear, particularly in these rural counties, about quote federal takeover or not. But you know, all these properties were purchased from willing sellers. People who want to get out, get away from the river, not deal with floods anymore.
So are these levees already here? Yes. Okay. And a, a big part of see, uh, the question was, are the levees, were the levees already here? Yes. Um, but a big part now is setback levees, right? The idea that we reclaimed the land so well, we put everything into this tight channel and created flood risk and very erosive, uh, high cost levee systems. And now we know that by setting levees back, we can get that FEMA 200 year levy protection so that small communities don't have to buy flood insurance, which is a huge burden on small communities and you know the economic um, demographic that is normally behind those levies. Um, and then you also get all the habitat benefits. So setback levies are a huge goal for California moving forward um, for all the great benefits that they have. The, um, one of the reasons this river is so healthy is that uh, at least half of this river that you can see on this map closer to two-thirds is unlevied completely. I mean, the, the mm. river can flood out for great ways. Starting downstream of Chico, which is right here, around about here, you have a, a levee system that is pretty wide and starts narrowing down to when you get to Calusa, uh, you know, that's, that's the river is between two levees and there's very few floodplains. And one of the things they've discovered, uh, I, this is, you know, brand new, uh, relatively 20 years ago we didn't know this but floodplains uh, are really important for salmon and, and and that's because when a river floods in the spring and uh, there's wa shallow water in this habitat that's where young juvenile salmon hide out to keep away from predators the water tends to be war warmer and more nutrient ri rich so they get larger and they more successfully uh, migrate out to the ocean because of that and portions of rivers where we cut the river off from its floodplain by having levees very close, like downstream of Calusa, uh, you do have pretty significant impacts on juvenile salmon. So this is not only important because of the terrestrial habitat for you know yellow-billed cuckoos and valley elderberry longhorn beetles, but also when it's flooded for uh, fish like salmon and steelhead. Is there money for setback levees now? Is anybody actually funding? There's a, a little bit um, that one of the things uh, my uh, compatriot and friends of the river, Ron Stork, who's uh, been there actually a year longer than when I started working there, uh, he's been instrumental in convincing DWR and other agencies to look at uh, revamping the flood control system and where possible setting back levees. And it's been done. There's a little bit of that happening at the J levy yep. right there at, at Hamilton City. They've, uh, there's more successful sites that you can see on the Feather River uh, that uh, uh, they've done setbacks. So it's slow uh, because it means educating locals, acquiring the property, then spending the money to set the levy back. But we're spending money to um, fix levees anyway. A lot of levees weren't really engineered. It's just like some guy in a, a backhoe just dug the sand out and laid it on the bank. So uh, the Corps is spending a lot of money in particular to uh, have levees that are really secure and safe. And if you're going to do that, you might as well also think about setting it back. Because if you set back the levee, you have less erosion problems, right? Because there's more, more space for the water. Yep. So Conservation strategy is all I'll say to that. The DWR conservation strategy is kind of the new guiding document for these setback levees and, and what the future of flood management should look like in California along our river systems. Uh, the Central Valley Flood Protection Control Board um, is going to be redoing, basically they, they recertify their flood plan um, every couple of years. And so uh, the 2017 plan, we actually just submitted comments on it yesterday um, to try to encourage them to look at that conservation strategy and to really be the lead agent and tell the federal agencies, this is our state, this is what we know is best for us, and we need your money to do the setback levies, to do the good stuff with us, and not do just what you think is cost beneficial and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, let's go for a hike down to the water. Yeah. Let's go touch the river. Yeah. Is yeah, uh, removing all the trees issue dead? No. Is what? The, 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 the Corps' uh, uh, vegetation nature. clearance policy on levees. <laughs> the war on nature. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we've got them to sort of table that policy, uh, but there's still pressure to do it. And uh, 
Some well, irrigation we, districts, we don't have the money to do it, so they're happy. Yeah. Other irrigation districts, well, we've always cleared the levee, and so we, we want to keep doing that because we're engineers and we like things clean and neat. Right. So, yeah, it's a, it's a problem, especially not so much here where you have a wide flood plain, Delta is a downstream problem too. Of, yeah. of Calusa, it's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. look like a jungle on your left <clears throat> in about the next 20 years. So as it grows, it becomes that different side. And then it's actually been very interesting. There's a lot of native grass planting as well. So what they found out is that actually open space in between riparian corridor plantings are key as well for foraging habitat and for other like leaf spells, vario and bird species, um, as well as amphibian and reptile species. And so we don't, you know, we've learned a lot in 30 years of riparian restoration and plantings. Um, and so this is one of the uh, newest and most beautiful examples of an area that we'll be hiking and exploring um, and enjoying all the animals for, you know, in perpetuity. Right. But to maintain this restored habitat, this area needs to flood regularly. And yeah. the take home is, we don't know how often but diversions to the site's reservoir, mm. particularly if you couple it with uh, Shasta Dam rays upstream, those will significantly reduce floods in this river. And so we don't know how often this area will flood less, but it could be enough that it would affect the future environmental health of this restoration project. And remember, there is no site's project. We've never seen the actual EIR or an actual project just a lot of talk about what it could be, what it should be, what it might do, what it might benefit. And so that's why it's kind of frustrating that we've seen all this great press, but <clears throat> but no environmental impact report or feasibility study. Hasn't there been tons of money poured into the non-existing projects already? Yeah, so the, the question was, how, hasn't there been a bunch of money already spent? Yeah, so U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in 2012 said they've spent at least $12.2 million on sites already in terms of modeling and mapping and site tours and supporting the uh, Joint Powers Authority, the site's JPA, which has members of the counties and then different water districts, um, which we're all supposed to investigate. And the reason they create a JPA a lot of times for these dam projects is because they can move faster than the bureaucrats. Right? They can have a meeting and make a vote and move faster in terms of making decisions. Um, in 2004, part of the water bond in 2004, the site's JPA got $1.75 million of our tax dollars to uh, investigate sites. And I do not know how much money has been spent by DWR staff on the project, but I would guess that it's another several million to $10 million. So we normally say it's, we've spent over $20 million. Wow. Uh, and that, we feel very comfortable in that statement. According to the chief of the storage studies at Reclamation, over 60 million has been spent. Yeah, that's wow. probably for all the for all the agent. No, that's 100 sites. 150 million wow. on wow. the three big ones: uh, sites, sites Shasta Temperance, Shasta. and Shasta. Yep. And none of the <laughs> reports are even close. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's the frustrating part: is how much of our money are they going to spend until we do setback levies? And all the stuff we already know is so good, you know. Right. I mean, you know, I'm fully willing to say, you know, maybe sites make sense if we have controls and it really does provide environmental water, but we don't know without studies. And, and the real problem is, is that these water districts and certainly almost every Republican member of the legislature and Congress in California and even some Democrats, John Garamendi of everybody, is walking around saying sites Will sites will uh, bring us world peace, basically. That's, that's the level of what he's saying we'll get from sites, almost, because everything else he's saying in terms of water for farms and cities and environment, we don't know. He doesn't know that. His own damn bill, co-sponsored with Doug LaMalfa, who represents this area in further north, says sites will provide 1.3 million acre feet of water. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. But you know, until there's a real public debate, it's very hard to counter that, and it's hard to have a public debate when we don't have the environmental documents and the feasibility report. If 
if I could add, that's why it's important to really pay attention to the opinion pieces that are popping up in the major Central Valley newspapers, and in particular the Fresno Bee, the Sacramento Bee, and just two days ago the Stockton Record. Uh, but the uh, proponents of these large water storage projects, I think if you did a word search in every single one of their opinion pieces, you would not find groundwater recharge mentioned once. And you wouldn't find what the average annual yield of the project You are. do not. The proponents always talk about the total capacity. They only speak of the capacity. And there's a huge difference between what a reservoir will hold versus what a reservoir actually produces annually. Let's well, Amy Barra says a huge benefit is better water skiing at Folsom. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about that. Steve's touched on a lot of the things that we were going to talk about um, in terms of his diversion rates and all that. But I just want to point out, you know, basically the beginning of a cut bank. So if you look all the way down to the bend here, through the bridge, where the river starts to turn, and you can see how it's eroding next to that walnut orchard. Mm -hmm. The river is creating a cut bank there, and that's not a habitat for the bank swallows, right? And so that's called accretion, where rivers pick up sediment and then they carry that load and then you have deposition which is where they drop it on the point bar and one of my favorite things that I've ever learned from Stacey Zappello and Eric Larson's video and growing up and hearing them speak is about primary succession and one of the really cool things about rivers is it's one of the three places in the world where you have primary succession which means that there's new land right you have glacial melt where glacial, glaciers melt and then it, it really, you know, basically reveals new soil where then plants and animals can start to, to propagate. You have volcanic eruptions and lava flows where it creates land and then you have rivers where basically they take from one side and they create new land on the other side as they meander. So point bars and that gallery forest that Steve was talking about are an amazing place and it's some of the most productive environments in the world because you have this life blooming, basically new land that is being propagated and inhabited by new plants from you know your willows all the way up to your cottonwoods. And we have a big problem on the river actually with our cottonwoods because the river hasn't been meandering. We're not, we don't see many of our 15 to 25 year old cottonwoods because the river hasn't been meandering. So we have old cottonwoods and then we have new cottonwoods that just aren't really getting established, right? the river's edge because the river's not able to do that meander and leave the cottonwoods on one far side and have that gallery forest pop up. So that's why we're planting them and doing the restoration as well for the red-shouldered hawks and all the other species that rely on this. So if you look back behind you here towards the west, you can see what a planned planting starts to look like a wild area. You can see the drip lines here in front of you and you can see as it kind of fades into the back, as these things grow and repropagate, um, it really becomes some amazing, amazing habitat and it doesn't look as much like a hand planted checkerboard. They leave the lines in for about 10 years, most of the time. Um, and then it, it just depends. A lot of times nowadays, I mean, with the drought cycles we've had, um, that's all the O&M, the operation maintenance, and try not to lose your investment. And they learned a lot in the beginning days, you know, in terms of their their soil samples. There was one famous planting um, where they basically only did a couple of, uh, of, of soil pits, and then they planted a bunch of valley oaks, and about six years later, they all died. <laughs> they went, what happened? And they didn't dig down deep enough. And so below that was a gravel bar, right? Because this is... <laughs> The river, when it moves, sometimes you have really good looking soil on top of what used to be a point bar, a bunch of gravels, and sometimes you have a hundred feet of topsoil up here. So, um, going down deep enough and doing a full soil analysis before you're planting, it became very pertinent. So, yeah, you know, details matter. And uh, uh, one of the problems uh, that we run into a lot uh, on projects that have significant environmental impacts is the sort of throwaway line, well, we'll just mitigate those impacts. And when the Corps of Engineer, Engineers were pushing their riprash project, which is they're going to take every eroding bend in this river and lay a rock down, uh, uh, when uh, through threat of lawsuits by the trust primarily you know, forced them to start trying to mitigate that, they said, well, we'll mitigate it by planting right here and have that on top of the bank. 
and they did that in several places, and uh, it wasn't very successful. They didn't. Like, okay, you have a bridge that provides access to this trail system 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and you're going to uh, replace it with a water taxi. Don't know who's going to pay for it, who's going to run it. Will it take horses? <laughs> you know, uh, and that kind of stuff just drives us nuts when we have to comment on it and say, that's not a real mitigation. EPA. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things. On the back of the fact sheet, there's this little graphic here top. And what this graphic is, it shows the, both the red and blue part of the, uh, the lines here show the flow of the river uh, at the Calusa Gauge, which is downstream of here, for December 9th through the 31st, 2014. And I chose that because if you go to DWR's site's website right now, which isn't called sites, it's called North of Delta Austrian Storage, or NODOS, N-O-D-O-S. I like to say no dues. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other thing that drives me nuts. None of these projects are called by their real names. The Shasta Dam Rays isn't the Shasta Dam Rays, it's the Shasta Lake Water Resources Investigation. Sites isn't called sites, it's called North of Delta Austrian Storage. But anyway, if you go to the NODOS site, there's a little EWR fact sheet, and it was put up there in response to concerns of, well, will sites even hold water during drought? I mean, is there any water that can be diverted to sites during drought? And they put this fact sheet on, it's called FAQ, Sites Water Diversions. Maybe Sites Reservoir Diversions. Sites Reservoir Diversions. And you look at these bars, this one and this one, the Delta water quality water disappears. Just not there anymore. And we sat down at DWRS, what happens to that water? Well, it gets two cents out of the Delta. We don't need Delta water quality water if the tunnels are built because you don't have to maintain salinity controls in the Delta. So, and that's another problem I have. So they say water quality. It's not water quality for ecosystems. Water quality for More for Delta farmers. Right. Well, that they're consumptive water supply. Yeah. So, and, you know, we're, we're allied with Delta farmers on the fight against the Delta tunnels, yep. but yet their Delta farming will disappear in the Delta tunnels. There's no feasibility report. So we don't know how it's going to be run. We just don't. So some of the other fun stuff, the Machupta Indian tribe, which is a native tribe up here. Machupta actually means when the snow melts, the valley is wet. Right? I love that. Because when I was working with Allie Knight and I heard that, I went, wow, that makes so much sense. Our hydrograph is completely turned upside down on the Sacramento River. And I always just like to let people know that, that when we put a dam on there, our hydrograph is pretty much the opposite of what it used to be. And so there's a lot of control. And so Sites is trying to capture the undammed tributary flow. So the creeks like Antelope and Deer Creek and Cottonwood Creek and the other flows um, up north, Mill Creeks, um, Cow Creek, there's a ton of basically undammed trips that when we get these flashy rains, the river actually is allowed to flood. When the river floods, it's never from Shasta Dam. Right? Shasta Dam is holding as much water back as possible to the river in the summertime. So we hold a lot of water back. And then those undamped trips are what give us the flood pulse flows. So that's what Sites is talking about trying to grab. They call it water wasted to the sea, right? That quote is always brutal because you have to have that physical riverine action. That's the physical movement of the creation and the deposition and, you know, the, the trees falling in, which is large woody debris, which is great habitat for our native species. Um, and so every time you have an intake on the river, you have to protect that intake, and you have to try to control the river. So you have to create a hard point, like we have here. <laughs> right. The river. And then you have to put in a fish screen to make nymphs happy and to make all the agencies happy. And so one of the other, so when we talk about the Delavan intake, which is 2,000 cubic feet per second, that's a large intake. That is very, that's a huge horsepower pump, probably four or five of them behind a fish screen on the river that's going to be trying to suck as much water as they can during that flood time. One of the other issues is that pumps don't like sediment. And when the river is in these flood stages, it's full of sediment. So 
TCCA and GCID, they have settlement bases, right? So when they talk about, oh, we're just going to divert all this water, it's going to work seamlessly, we're going to take all this water, it's going to put it in the canal, we're going to send it down as fast as we can. TCCA can't do that. GCID can because of their Oxbow setup. They actually have a much better setup to take sediment-laden water. But that means that sediment is going to fill their canals, and they're going to have to do a lot of management going in there with backhoes every year to take that sediment out to keep the capacity of that canal in operation. So there's just a lot of other questions, right? That's <laughs> When I look at it from a hydrologist perspective and a water policy and looking at it ag agriculturally, I, I studied ag business for a year. I always wanted to be a you know, a farmer before I decided that I couldn't go against my heart and I loved water so much and I wanted to come home and try to preserve our way of life and I knew water was going to be the big thing. Um, in terms of the east side, I just want to tell you about that. The major impact is groundwater, right? The Sacramento River used to be a permanently gaining stream as far south as Verona, meaning that the river actually gained flow from groundwater all the way to Verona. It is now... Verona grinds down south, basically by Calusa. You can just say, like, basically at the, at the bottom end of upstream. Yeah, stream. The airport. Yeah. Um, so, a bunch of miles that way, right? Now, as soon as it hits Red Bluff, it starts losing water. As soon as it hits our valley, basically, it's trying to recharge the groundwater. We are a low priority groundwater management basin under Sigma because we have more than other folks, but we all know that our wells have gone deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And so the more we take out ahead of Butte County and ahead of these east side pumpers and you know diverters, the more that water table will drop. And so you know, Butte County is kind of special because we have tributaries that come through certain areas that have really good groundwater, others don't. Uh, but there's all these impacts. Another term that Steve used, which is just part of education, is conjunctive use. Everyone know what conjunctive use is? Okay. Um, so conjunctive use is basically using surface water and groundwater to meet your water demands, your water needs. The reason, if you ever hear conjunctive management, that's a dream. Again, that is not a real thing. You can't manage what you can't meter. And we don't meter groundwater use. So, so to not say yet. that... Not yet, right? That's part of Sigma. But to say that we're conjunctively managing is a very dangerous thing because you have one bank account that you don't know how much is in there, and you have another bank account that's being very well regulated and understood, right, which is your service water. And so we're conjunctively using water at a state level, pumping from the ground and using service water. But we're not conjunctively managing. We're trying to get there. We're 30 years behind Texas and a lifetime behind Colorado, right? Um, and so... Conjunctive use is what we're doing. Conjunctive management is what we're working towards as a state. So what I thought conjunctive use included the concept of if you did flood irrigation and that percolates down and recharges the groundwater, which right. then somebody else can use. Right. So it, 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 it's a, you know, one of the things we bring up as an alternative surface storage is groundwater storage. But to do groundwater storage, you need to have facilities. And uh, since er almost every drop of water in California is already taken by somebody, um, one of the things that uh, the dam builders can say, well, you can't have, you can't restore groundwater without building new surface storage because you need to capture that flood water. So it, it's a tricky issue. And let me, I just want to talk about wells real quick because I found that a lot of the rooms that I speak to don't understand how well drillers work, right? People say, well, I have a shallow well, right? So I'm not affecting the deep, the deep aquifer. Okay, that's fine. You have a shallow well. Then the guy with the deep well says, well, I have a deep well. I'm not affecting your shallow aquifer. <laughs> not true. Every good well driller in the world perforates at every good water zone, right? So you have the surface here, you drill down. You'll hit a barrier layer, whether it's clay or bedrock or some type of layer that's, that's impermeable, it's hydrostatic, right? It doesn't let water through. So as they're drilling down, they kind of hit that layer and they go, okay, <clears throat> so 80 feet down, I hit that layer. So we'll perforate at 70 feet down the first time. Then they keep drilling down, right? 
they get into the middle aquifer, which is going to be a lot of this valley spaghetti. Um, you know, you'll have gravel, and then you'll have soil, and then you'll have some, you know, organic matter from back in the day, and then you'll have gravel again. And they get down to the base of that, and they hit a clay layer, or they hit a bedrock layer, and they go, okay, let's perforate there. You're always trying to go to the bottom of all the good water areas. Then you punch down finally into the Tuscan, which is our deep water aquifer that's recharged USGS maps from the upper Sierra and the Cascades, right? Water that you put on your farm does not reach even the middle aquifer. It's only going to the shallow aquifer. So that may run out and go into your local tributary, your stream. But most of the time, it doesn't because, you know, the active area of soil is about five feet. So all I'm saying is anybody who has a deep well, they're taking water from every zone within that area. A shallow well, they're the ones that get in trouble. And normally that's a small farmer or an old well. And the bummer is, is people say too bad, right? If your well goes dry, you should have, just like home insurance, you know, you got to have insurance, you got to have something in your wallet in case your water heater breaks and it ruins your floors, you got to pay to fix it. They say the same thing to these small farmers in our area. When their well goes dry, well, you should have the $50,000 to call up a well driller and go deeper. Um, and so the unincorporated groundwater users are a huge piece of the NorCal, you know, a culture. Um, and 65 to 80 percent of us up here are on wells. We're not on the irrigation district. So it's a big deal for us to look at sustainably doing that and looking at conjunctive use wherever it is as, as a big thing to keep our eyes on. D is not going to build in more pumps and I'm wondering what got them to say that they're not going to build more pumps and do we need to find similar ways to put pressures on other agencies and organizations? The question is GCID, Glen Clusey Irrigation District, one of the largest senior water rights holders pre-1914 on the river. Um, was was trying to put in five new high velocity, high volume pumps, um, and people in Cape, which is a nearby community, and in Orland basically had an uproar because GCID is closer to the river. When GCID pumps at that shallow level, that mid level, and that deep level, they're almost because it's so shallow there. They're literally sucking subterranean surface water out of the river. So they can pump and pump and pump and pump, but it's almost like they're doing a surface water diversion. But when they get into that middle and that deep, that was affecting the wells to their west side. And so those communities came together, they said, you know, don't do this, don't do this, you already have your wells, you already are pumping too much. Um, they decided to back out um, because it was just too much pressure. But that's why we always call this a marathon, right? I mean, Sites Reservoir, we've spent all this money on it, it never seems to die. These projects, whether they're good or bad or ugly, it's normally about the money, which is the overall duty of an irrigation district, is to provide its service providers and to have a healthy chunk of money in their, in their bank account. Um, and so <clears throat> they put it away for now, but it's definitely not off the table. They said they're going to basically renegotiate it. They're coming up with a new water budget and a sustainable water delivery plan. And once they have that, they're going to defend their pumps and then they're going to come back with it. Um, so it's it's kind of nonstop, but uh, it's that's why these groups have to stick around. <laughs> you know. I got one more question. It's been mentioned a couple of times that there's no local financial partner for the site's proposal. Yep. Is there a local financial partner for any of the dams that are currently being promoted? Nope. Not one. No, no one. I mean, they're, they're forming JT, they're forming Joint Partnership Association. There's a pretty solid one for sites. So to form a joint powers, you have to cough up some money. Well, no, you can you can have a joint powers authority, but in order to get a commitment of water from either okay. the DWR or the bureau, you have to, you have to say because uh, theoretically, the only public money being spent on these projects are for studies. Would it be legally possible, for instance, if you know the state money went for what gets maximum fifty percent? Would it be possible to use federal money? On the other side, yeah. And then the last thing I'll say about what you just said about who's going to get the water, in their own reports, less than 10% is from the Sacramento River Valley. From sites. From sites. 80 to 90% will go to East Bay Mud, which falls from Water District, and South Delta users. Really? East Bay Mud gets water from that? 
they not, could. Yeah, not but, you mean more likely Contra Costa. Contra Costa, but their their facilities seem like but it's just right, they, they put the different agencies or the different water districts in there as potential buyers. And it's very interesting because basically what they say is we know that Northern California irrigators can't afford this water when we build it. So it's going to go out of the area. I do no not what. understand the JPA purpose. But the man of water is not going to be they sell the water. Well, that's it. That's and, the, and the manager of GCID is from Westlands. The guy that manages Bank Lewis Irrigation District, he's from Westlands. So that's where he came from. The new manager of the Joint Powers Authority just came from Westlands. <laughs> right. And so this is all a big shell game. And uh, and it, it is the good old boys club. One of the one of the interesting things I learned last year as a water leader for the state of California with the Water Education Foundation, uh, with Thomas Harder, uh, who's a professor at UC Davis and the head of the Groundwater Resources Association for California. Um, it took Enron completely screwing over our energy sector before we got true energy oversight, right, and energy regulation. And most professors and water professionals in California at this point are hoping that the drought and the reality will set in and we will finally start to have a water market. Right now, the way water transfers go in California, there's no open market, it's a phone call, right? It's who you know. Westlands calls GCID and says, hey, we're not going to get the water allocation that we wanted as our settlement contractor. We want to buy a bunch of your water. Can you tell your guys to switch on their pumps up there in the Sac Valley because you have pumps that work and send us your water? It's a personal phone call. And the manager can say, sounds good, 700 bucks an acre foot. We're going to make a couple hundred mil. Game on. We'll send it on down, right? So there is no true water market, which makes it hard for buying water for the environment, which makes it hard for us to really look at our true water budget and figure out where things are going for the best use. It's uh, it's kind of a an insider trading system. It's very interesting. Yeah, let's head back. We need a transparent water market. Stealing water. Stealing property that's protected.